In Romans chapter 5, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And then we're going to flip over and read a portion in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace, with God. Now, turn over to Romans chapter 1 with me. And I want to use these two portions of Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, or that means suppress, the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest, it's revealed in them for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and the four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed... Now, look at this. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I wanted to talk to you today about the topic of dangerous assumptions. These two places, the first place that we looked, we saw that there is peace that we can have with God. There is peace that we can have with our Creator. And the second place I just showed you is that natural man think they have peace with God, but they don't. A very dangerous assumption to make is to believe you have peace with God, and you don't. And we see the characteristics of what men do. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask, Lord, your blessings upon your word. May it be clear. Father, may you use it. May you impact your children today. May you impact those who do not know you as their Lord and Savior. May they come to repentance and faith. May you draw them by your power. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a time where men and women have reasoned away God or they redefine God. They view God's people as cruel, hateful, judgmental. They're neighbors with the latest binoculars spying on everything they do. TV show after TV show shows pastors as being goofy, uneducated, better than thou's, and a congregation of cold hearts of hatred towards those who are going through difficult times in their lives. 
You know, it's interesting because mass media spreads lies. You know, lies spread faster than truth. And the lies are being spread through mass media. We see a society that's getting shaped and they're getting uh, their information off of lies about who God is and who God's people are. So I always feel compelled, just as, you know, the responsibility. I don't know how many of you are parents, and, uh, you know, I applaud and, and I admire those uh, who have sacrificed to keep their children at home and teach them at home and homeschooling and not to put them in public schools. Some people are not, uh, they're not as fortunate. They cannot do that. They, they have to take their children to public schools. And then as soon as we know they're being indoctrinated, we know they're being taught these things. And you don't have to go to school to see it. It's in television. It's, and even in the most innocent of cartoons, we see that every, I mean, just the agenda, the attack, the attack, the attack of redefining God to these children. I always feel compelled to come back to the subject. Uh, if you heard, uh, I gave a, uh, I, I made a message in Georgia, and I was in, at Rye Patch at the conference. So I don't want you to think it's the same sermon. It's the same text. But the Lord has always bringing me back to this concept and this idea of man's recreated God. The God who man has recreated. Now, in Romans 5, it talked about being justified, we have peace with God. I want to quickly talk about what that is. That's legal peace. That's judicial peace. How do you stand in the eyes of God? How do you stand via God's law? Uh, many people believe that, you know, they can gain righteousness by keeping the Ten Commandments, keeping the law, as long as they keep some of it and not, I mean, just enough uh, that they can and they just, they're good hard-working people, they're good humanitarianism, they're okay with God. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death, that, that the one who breaks the law, they must pay for the penalty of the law, and the penalty is laid out before us. It is impossible to keep the law of God. And it is impossible for God to not judge those who have broken his law, even the, the smallest of it, and even the, the least amount of times. So the concept here of justification is how can I be right in the eyes of the law? You know, the most dangerous place to be is one who has broken the law. And the only safe place to be is where the law is satisfied. We know that Christ has fulfilled the law. Christ has paid for the penalties of the law. Now, justification means to be declared righteous, to be forgiven in the eyes of the law, from the penalty of the law. But I want us to, to see something. Being justified is this legal peace. That is peace with God. Peace with God is your position, your legal standing before God. Imagine God's taking off his, his robes and he's putting on the robe of, of a judge. And he only has the, the law before him. And he is there in, by what you have done in your life. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken his commandments. That's what the word of God says. None of us are righteous. No, not one. Righteous means right in the eyes of God via the law, via him being a judge. So what's being justified? Justified is being declared not guilty. And the only way to be declared not guilty in the eyes of God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And his shed blood, his atonement, his substitutionary, sacrificial death for your sins and your sins alone. Don't worry about everybody else's sins. What about yours? Are your sins forgiven? Well, if they are, you're justified. That means you have peace with the state. You have peace with God. Hostility has ceased. Now, I want to talk about that. That is the biblical definition of peace with God. But man wants to reinvent God, and they want peace with a different God. They don't want peace with the God of the Bible. They, they want to reinvent him. So, this is man's hostility towards God. Now, peace means cease from hostility. 
It not only just means tranquility of mind, but it means that two peoples or two groups have been reconciled. Now that's a big, it's another big word. Reconciled is a word, this peace of God, it presupposes that there was a prior state of hostility. Reconciliation must mean there was a prior state of separation. You can't be reconciled unless you're separated. So, this, the opposite of peace with God is hostility towards God. Now, here's the thing. For true reconciliation, both parties must be reconciled together. It can't be just one. So, this idea of a ceasefire, a hostility, is both parties, both parties must be at peace with the other. What this means is God is at peace with the believer, and the believer is at peace with God. Now, if you're still in Romans chapter 1, what is man's hostility towards God? What is this prior existence of reconciliation? What is this prior hostility, this prior firing, this prior enmity? Verse 22, well, verses 18 through what we just read, is God has given you a truth and a knowledge, a general knowledge about him. When you walk outside, you see God's eternal Godhead and his power. Not only do you see that God exists, a creator exists, I'm the creature, he's the creator, there's intelligent design. Not only do you see it, but you feel it. Because when you feel that guilt of doing something wrong, that means that something must have put that guilt there to begin with. Because your guilt's the same as my guilt. It doesn't matter which community you grow up in, in what era, in what village. Your, it's murder's wrong. It, we have the same objective moral values. So where there's law inside of us, there's a moral law, that means there must be a lawgiver because all of us have the same one. It, it, it's not molded and shaped by our experiences of community. I mean, some of them are, but for the cores are not. So God has revealed that himself to you, but what have we done? We've suppressed the knowledge of God. We hold the truth and unrighteousness. And God says that his wrath has been revealed against all forms of ungodliness of men who hold the truth and ungodliness. It's like taking a beach ball and trying to keep it underwater. You're taking the knowledge of God and you're suppressing it. You're uh, trying to suppress it. So, so I don't believe there's any, anything as, or such thing as a true atheist. Because I believe God has given everybody the knowledge of his existence in a general revelation. So, what did man do? Well, not only did they suppress the knowledge of God, they used their smarts. They, they decided to be wise. And you know what? I, we all benefit greatly with the ingenuity of man, the reasoning of man. I love air conditioning. I know that you all love air conditioning. That's the ingenuity of man. You know man can take natural things in the environment and man can manipulate them to achieve what they want them to achieve. You know what electricity is? Electricity are electrons bouncing back and forth between magnetic poles. Man has manipulated nature to achieve what he wanted it to do. And so what does man do in their wisdom? In verse 22, they profess themselves to be wise. They become fools. And what do they do? They change the glory of God. Or I'm sorry, they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So man says, I want to be at peace with God, but I want to be at peace with this God. I want to be at peace with the God that I'm going to invent. I'm going to engineer. I'm going to manipulate because of my wisdom. So there's typically three different types, and I want to go over these three different types. Ever since time has really began, 
Well, they invent, they reinvent God to be the super soft, coddling grandfather. This is the God who sits up in the heavens and has a white, flowing, long beard whose only job is to love you and provide for you and to forgive you. As a grandfather. That's his only job. He just loves you no matter what. I mean, it, you can do no wrong. He's just going to keep giving you things and keep giving you things. And that is the God of people's imagination. That's a very popular God. That no matter what you do, you know what? You can have your own truth. And you can just deny God exists and go about your whole way. But at the end of the day, God has to forgive you. That's his job. That's God's job. So, the hostility of man says we will reinvent God. We will change the glory of God into uncorruptible things or corruptible things. Into a lie. Well, there's that type of God. And there's also a second type of God called the deism. Now, this God, he is so spectacularly great and infinitely big. He is, I mean, he is as big as the vastness of the universe itself. Think about our closest neighboring sun, our closest neighboring star is uh, Proxima Centura, which is four light years away. That means traveling at the speed of light, it'll take you four years to get to. That's our neighbor. So God is infinitely large. He is so big, he does not care what happens in my little tiny insignificant life. He's got, he's got a universe to rule. He's got, the, you know, he's got this and he's got that. Why, why would he care about anything in my life, let alone my daily life? My every second of my life, what I fear, what I think. I mean, he's got the Jupiter moons to keep in orbit, right? I mean, if, if gravity's off a little bit, we're all going to get sucked into a black hole or we're all going to careen into space. A fraction of gravity being off. So he's got this big planet to control. That view of God makes God unattached, unconcerned, detached. He wound the universe up like a clock, and he just said, go, and I don't care. Do what you want to do. That's the deist look. Then there's the look of the back-scratching, the mutual back-scratching God. This view sees God as a God who can be manipulated. Just as mankind has taken the things of the forces of nature and manipulated it to accomplish our will, we also want to take the visible evidence that there is a God and we want to manipulate that visible evidence just like everything else that we manipulate to, for our own use. It's a mutual back scratch. God, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. We see many that are like this. What this view says is, God, you know what? I'm going to build you a cathedral. I'm going to inlay it with gold. I'm going to dedicate my money. I'm going to dedicate my time. I'm going to give tithe. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do all this service. I'm going to, I'm going to think about you. I'm going, to, I'm going to dedicate my children. I'm going to be baptized. But you've got to scratch my back. God, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. We see this a lot in polytheism. Now think about what Paul, Paul confronted this at Mars Hill. He went up to the Athenians there at Mars Hill and they had erected this statue to the unknown God as if God needed a statue of himself. He had, they, had, they had all these multiple gods who they did this. You know, if, if, uh, if I'm taking a test, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to the God of wisdom. If, if, if I'm going on a long sea voyage, I'm going to pray to the God of the sea. And so everything's a mutual back scratch. But Paul had said to them, you are manipulating the true God. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He is the God of all the heaven and all the earth. And what, what men want to do is they want to take God from where he is and bring him down into their little box and control him. 
Because what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this for you, and then you need to do that for me. How many times, and I know many people who believe in the Lord and love the Lord, how many times do we find ourselves bargaining with God? Lord, if, if, you, just, if you just help me get through this, I'll do this. Lord, if, if you just do this, I'll do this. Lord, if you just do this, I'll do this. Now, the problem with that, that's not the God of the Bible. This view of mutual backscratching, it sees that you believe God needs something from you. God does not need anything. God does not need you. God did not create the universe because he needed the universe. God does not need me to scratch his back. God does not need us. We need God. That's the God of the Bible. God is showing us in the Bible, our state before him, that we're sinners in the hand of an angry God. We need his mercy. How many times do, do, do you share the gospel, or even now, and people scoff at it, and what they're really hearing is, you know what, when you give the gospel, God needs you to believe in him. God doesn't need you to believe in him. You need to believe in him. God needs you so that way he can have mercy on you. God doesn't need to have mercy on you. You need God to have mercy on you. That's the God in the Bible. So we go to him. And none of these, none of these views that I just gave, the grandfather view, yes, God is love. But he is just as much just as he is love. And every one of these three views of God, these three generic categories of God, every one of them are rationalization, they're men's reinvention of God, in their wisdom, in their wisdom, they want to reinvent God because they've suppressed them. Uh, the deist view, it is true that God is infinitely great, He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He's all those things, but he's intimately involved with us. God created you to be in his image, to have fellowship with you, to love you, for you to be thankful to him. He walked in the cool of the garden with Adam. It was God's good pleasure to be intimately involved with us in a love relationship. God didn't have to do that. That is what God has chosen to do, to love us. Now, yes, God is great. God is big, but you know what? He's in my every second detail of my life. There's the mutual back scratch, and the problem again with that is we have this idea that, that God needs you. God needs your money. God, if I win the lottery, I'm going to donate so much to you. <laughs> um, I remember a long time ago I did that. I was, uh, I was 18 or 19. I was like, the jackpot is, I don't know what it was, 200 million? Woo, Lord. Hey, let, let's go in on this together. And he owns everything. It wasn't until I matured a little bit in the faith and the word of God that I realized how silly was that. God needed me to win that lottery so I could put money in his church. That's, that's what my thought was. And so that's man's hostility. Man's hostility reinvent God. They think they have peace with God. They think they have peace with God. It's a dangerous assumption because they've made peace with a God that they've invented. They have not made peace with the God, the real true God of the word of God. So they're like, okay, my hostility has ended towards God because I have one that I'm comfortable with and I can place in his box and he's not going to judge me. He's going to be my loving grandfather, just gives me treats when I visit and he's just all love, no justice, no judgment, none of those things. So why don't you stay over there and I'm going to live the way I want. It's a God... So they're like, okay, I'm not hostile towards you, God. But it takes two. That doesn't mean that God's not still hostile towards them. Reconciliation meant there was a fragmentation. 
that fragmentation is still there outside of the work and the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross in faith alone, in Christ alone. When you come to him and you, in humility and in you, that pride just goes away. You see yourself in your state as a sinner who needs to be forgiven before an angry and wrathful God who snuffs you out like that, sends you into eternity and a devil's hell. And he is just in doing it. And he is love as well. A lot of people are like, well, how could God love me and send me to hell? Now, I want to talk to you about the men who rationalize this God. You all have seen it on TV, haven't you? You've seen it on TV. Okay, God's all love, God's all love. And then uh, somebody comes up and says, well, if God's all love, how can, why is there death? Why is there tragedy? Why is there leukemia? Why is there child pornography? Why is there sin? Why is there alcoholism? Why is there drug abuse? Why is there wickedness? Why are all these things? Because they've not defined the God of the Bible. They've only defined the God in their imagination. He's the, he's the super soft grandfather, remember? Oh, God is love, but he's also just. His wrath is revealed right now against sin, and it will be revealed his, you can see God's wrath right now in his judgment on sin. That sin is death. Um, God's hostility. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. That does not sound like a super soft grandfather. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. That does not tell me of a God who's unattached and does not care, the deist view. Psalm 2 says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Any nation, king, person, anybody who breaks their bands and casts away their cords from the Lord who rebel against God, what will happen in Psalm 2? It says, Then shall he speak to them in his wrath. That's God's hostility. Revelation, at the very end. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh. Do we see that we need his mercy? Do we see that we need his salvation? We need it. He does not need us to come to him. We need to go to him. Because there is the gift of eternal life. There's eternal life. There's life. There is the true peace with God. Back in Romans chapter 5, real quickly. I know we're almost getting there, but I want to show you this. We saw man's hostility, and we saw God's hostility. But I want you to read in chapter 5, verse 1, where has the hostility ceased against God? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there. That's it. That's the only place that there's peace with God is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you... <laughs> Aren't you thankful the Lord provides a way of peace in any means? And the means is through His Son. I mean, we're the beggars. We're the ones who need forgiveness. We're the ones who have sinned against God. But God has offered it by His grace. He has offered it through His Son. He didn't have to love you. He didn't have to save you. He could have destroyed us all. And it could have been awful. But we are justified. Oh, we have peace with God. That means that hostility has ceased. Hostility of God has ceased on me. And my hostility has ceased towards God. I, know, I have a revelation. I have a true revelation of the God of the Bible. Of the real God. And that real God has offered salvation and mercy through his son. His son, Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
John 3.18. First John says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How do we have this peace? We have this peace in the position of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. He says in chapter 5, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Only by the blood are we saved. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ in verse 9. We're justified. We're at peace. We will not endure the wrath of God. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That also means in his life. We will be saved as Noah was in the ark. We're going to be saved from God's wrath in Christ because we've been reconciled. Remember that word reconciled. That fragmentation no longer exists. We've been brought together. The hostility has ceased between me and God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he brought me to himself. Oh, that's the grace of God. Peace is in our position in Christ, our legal standing. We're justified. Peace is also in the proven by the Holy Spirit who sheds abroad in our hearts. Look at chapter 5, verse 5. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God gives us the Holy Spirit, and get this. You've, you've often heard there's a peace with God and the peace of God. The Holy Spirit brings us a peace in times of tribulations. That's what it says, in times of trouble. Uh, the things that are going on in your life, the vehement storms of life, that the Holy Spirit is producing a peace within you. It's not a man-made, a self-made. It's not a self-help. It's a God-help with the Holy Spirit who is bringing you and giving you grace. And that Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, is bringing you assurance that you have the verse 1, the peace with God. Because if this affliction takes me down, I need to know that heaven's my home. And I know that heaven's my home because Christ settled my payment long ago. He settled it. Not only did he save me, but he called me and I'm part family. I've been adopted. I have the spirit of adoption whereby I cry, Abba, Father. I do not go to God as a God who is my judge. I go to him as my father, my loving father, my giving father, my compassionate father. That's who I go to him as. So the Holy Spirit produces assurance in our hearts that we do have peace with God. Judicially, legally, we're justified. Last, and I wanted to bring this out. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school when we talked about the grace of God. Not just lost people reinvent God. Think about that. Sometimes even those who profess Christ as their Savior lose focus on who God is and who they are. They lose focus on the grace of God. They have forgotten that it was mercy that saved them. They have forgotten that they are but a dead dog without the grace of God. We talked about the publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee stood up and he prayed to God and he thanked God for all of the good qualities that he is. And you know what? I believe the Pharisee believed that God gave him all these wonderful great qualities so that he could be a policeman for him on earth. That means he could walk around and judge everybody he wants. Hey, look how much better I am than you are. Thank you, God. Thank you for making me so much better than everyone so that way I can show them how better I am. Is that the way God gets glory? Is that the way that you lead people to Christ? Do the broken people really need to see how much better you are than them? People have forgotten who God is. People are saved. They've made all this sacrifice in their life. And because they've made this sacrifice and others haven't and they've fallen into sin, you know what? They deserve what they got because they didn't make the same sacrifices as I did. So I'm not going to have any compassion on them. They made their own bed. They need to lie in it. I'm not going to give them money. They did it to themselves. 
Is that the way we are to be as God's people? Or we're to be compassionate, aren't we? Aren't we to show the grace of Christ, the love of Christ? Aren't we to show to others what God has really done to you? And when you have a proper view of grace, you have a proper view of God, then that is the God that you need to show. It's a God of grace. It's a God of mercy. What's the fruits of the Spirit? Gentleness, meekness, loving, forbearing, kindness, goodness. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. That's out of a heart of love, not out of a heart of judgmentalism and, and hardness. It's not just lost people who try to reinvent God. They, saved people will lose focus of who they are and who God is and that they're still at the end of the day a sinner saved by grace. And what they need to do is show others, show the broken how God had come and changed your life and loved you anyway. He, God, loved you in your brokenness and he saved you and he called you to himself. And there he has established you. He's given you the peace and the hope and the love and a purpose in life and brought you out of darkness, brought you out of despair. People need to see that God has done that for you. How are people going to see God's done that for you when all you are is cruel to them because of what is happening to them. No one ever comes to Christ seeing how God has made you better than them. They come when they see that God has had mercy on you. They come when they see you glorying in God's mercy and forgiveness and changing your life to joy. Which one would you be more spiritually led by, the publican or the Pharisee? When you see the Pharisee, does that bring you to Christ? Or when you see the publican, does that bring you to Christ? How about as God's people as we give? The grace of giving, loving, despite the brokenness. Let me show you, let me tell you what God did for me. I'm just a sinner, the same as you. But God, in his love and his mercy and his goodness, this is who God is. You must see yourself as broken. You must see yourself as a sinner before God. That's it right there. David said, I acknowledge my sin before you. It said David had a heart after God. David failed. David failed a lot, but you know what? You know what David did? He knew he failed before God. He didn't try to explain it away. He didn't try to blame somebody else. But the Lord loved me anyway. He saved me despite me. And that is who we are to be. We're to be salt and the light. Did you know salt not only preserves, but it gives a different flavor to the same thing? You can have beef and I can have beef, but if I have salt, I got a different flavor. The Lord has saved you and given you victory in life. He's given you a grace through every trial. That person may be going through the exact same thing you are, but you're salt. You've got a different flavor. You've tasted the Lord that he is good. And light. The light, we're to be light, we're to shine on him. Jesus' compassion, a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus has come to save sinners of who I am chief. Jesus did not save me. God did not save me so that I could rub my piety in anybody's face. That's not love. That's not love. It is to demonstrate to others, here's the light of Christ. Look what Jesus did for me. I hope, I, I pray the Lord's richly blessed you as we looked at these things. We see that how men reinvent God. We see the true peace with God. That is through the blood of Jesus Christ and his son and by faith. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day, this time, this life. Father, I do pray for those who do not know you as their personal Savior. Father, how dangerous it is to assume who you are. May they come to the truth. May you show them the truth of who you really are, that there's still hostility, there's still fragmentation. 
Father, and that you do save today. You do have mercy. You do offer it through the blood of Jesus Christ today. They will repent of their sins, turn to you in faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and believe upon him that the, he paid for their sins the day you said that you will save them. So for whosoever shall calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, well, thank you so much for your grace, Lord. Father, forgive us when we lose sight of who you are as your people and we feel self-righteous and we see sin around us. Father, may you remind us if it were not by your grace, we would also suffer the same thing. Father, may we show the love of Christ to others, the compassion, grace, and mercy. And may all things be pleasing to you, Lord, in Jesus' name.